Modern Retro Games. Man, these games seem to be all the rage these days. Whether it be from shows, merchandise, and even music, games from the 80s have infested pop culture today. But what exactly makes them so popular? Well, in a world where games are all about graphics and specs and 1080p, 720p, everyone showing off their peas, some gamers like to take a step back to a simpler time. A time where a game is sold through its level design or innovative gameplay rather than how realistic you can make your dogs look. They're simplistic, they're fun, they're unforgiving, and for better or worse, they're easier to make. But you see, this also opens the door of modern retro games to everyone. Larger companies can make them for a quick buck, while a lot of indie developers can step into the gaming business with them. And unfortunately, because of all this, everyone and their mother tried making one. So, that's where I come in. I believe that I've found a game that shows almost all the good and bad things about this genre, only for them to all fall apart completely in execution. So without further ado, it's time to go back into... licensed games. Here we go again. BNGR! Oh, Cartoon Network, how the mighty have fallen. And risen again! Now I know all of you know about the whole 90s cartoon trend, where people are like, Oh, the nostalgia, and they're funny, and new cartoons suck, what is this orange thing? It's stupid! But let's be honest here, Cartoon Network has actually been getting their stuff together. The former CEO who wanted to make Cartoon Network all live action shows, which I gotta say is a really stupid idea, has left the company, and a lot of good cartoons have come out of it. You got Adventure Time, Steven Universe, Gumball, Uncle Grandpa... Uh, and hey, they even got Sonic Boom coming in the fall. But there's one show on the channel that I love above all the rest. Regular Show. Now, of course, I can't show any footage of it, but I'll explain the plot. The show's about two best friends, a Blue Jay named Mordecai and a raccoon named Rigby, who both work and live in a park with a bunch of other interesting people. The point of the series is that it takes what should be a normal, realistic problem and just blows it out of proportion. It's funny, it's relatable, and in my opinion, it's just really fun to watch. But there's another thing people really love about the show. There's so much stuff from the 80s. There's the movie rental store, the retro game systems, the power glove. Mm. So when I heard they were making a retro game from this show, I couldn't help but buy it. And let's just say I learned a very valuable lesson about retro games. That's because this game sucks! <sighs> Alright, to the creators of this game, WayForward Technologies are no strangers to licensed games, and a lot of them are actually really good. They made DuckTales Remastered, Batman the Brave and the Bold, and heck, they even made an Adventure Time game already, which plays a lot like Zelda 2, the oddball in the franchise. But let's not get into that argument now, shall we? Please? Well anyway, as much as I love them, WayForward is also one of the most unstable developers in the industry. These guys have made a lot of bad licensed games. Like, I'm not kidding here, despite their own IPs being fantastic games, a good chunk of their licensed ones are either rushed, or short, or... No! But hey, since I really like their Adventure Time game, which has tons of fan service by the way, I thought Mordecai and Rigby and 8-Bit Land would be the same. Right? Right? So anyway, let's talk about my first impressions with the game. Okay, so right off the bat, this game is really trying to win my heart. The manual of the game has the same layout as the Sega Master System ones, the first console I ever owned. The box promises action platforming, side-scrolling shooters, playing as both Mordecai and Rigby? No! WayForward's forte has always been 2D platformers, so to hear regular show getting the same treatment? Oh, it was any fan's dream. Upon more research, the composer of this game is also Jake Kaufman, one of my favorite musicians in the industry. There seriously isn't a single soundtrack from this dude that I didn't love. And yes, that includes Carnage Rally. Okay, that seriously has to be the worst box art ever made. The, the hair? And the story's even apparently written by J.G. Quintel, the creator of the series. The planets seemed like they were all aligned for this game to be a huge success. But honestly, this game didn't waste any time proving me wrong. In fact, no, it took only about five minutes. So, in the opening cutscene, we see Benson wanting Mordecai and Rigby to mow the lawn. They moan and groan about it, whatever, and then they get a mysterious game console in the mail, and play a game that seems to be labeled, best game ever. But Mordecai has his finger over the B and E, so I guess it's up to you to decide, you know what I'm saying? So then the duo gets sucked into the TV, and of course they gotta beat the game to escape. Fascinating. Now right off the bat, I was able to make a list of problems I have with this game. Where is the voice acting for these guys? Why is the story so bland? This is worse than any setup I've ever seen on the show. Where are all the other main characters in the game? Skips, Pops, Margaret, Muscle Man, they're nowhere to be found. It's just Mordecai and Rigby beating a game with no established villain. And since this is the only cutscene until the credits roll, this is pretty freaking disappointing. 
kind of like this entire game. Now it may seem kinda dumb that I'm bashing an 8-bit game for its narrative, but come on, WayForward got the license to one of the biggest cartoons on TV, and for a $30 retail game, they made about 2 minutes worth of story with the editing skills of a PowerPoint presentation. But hey, you know what, let's forget about this license for a sec. What about this old school gameplay and action platforming I was promised? Here we go. So I start up the game and BAM! We already got a problem. That's not- it's not 8-bit! Are you kidding me? I'm out. You know, I really love when a game false advertises right off the bat. You see, what this game appears to be is what I like to call a 12-bit platformer. It has the music and level design of an 8-bit platformer, but the actual aesthetics of the game are based off the 16-bit era. And even then, that's kind of stretching it here. But yeah, if you're gonna call your game 8-bit, make it 8-bit. Otherwise, call it Mordecai and Rigby and Retro Land. Okay, ran over, let's move on. This is stupid. So the way this game plays at first is pretty standard. You can run, jump, and stomp enemies on the head like a certain Italian plumber. It's not exactly anything I'd consider good, but it's a little bit of fun at least. You can even switch to Rigby at the press of a button, so you can get into small corridors... Oh no... And that's where things go horribly wrong. This is the worst level design I've ever seen in a platformer. There's just linear and pointless block mazes where you have to squeeze into with Rigby. There's so much open space and everything looks so, so plain. And to throw even more frustration in, the hitboxes of these enemies are really precise. Like, really precise, you don't understand. If you want to kill human enemies, you have to jump pixel perfect on their heads and pray they don't move. I just don't understand. It's way harder than it should be, and eventually you'll just avoid hitting enemies in general, which should be half the fun in a platformer. Isn't it supposed to feel, you know, satisfying to jump on people's heads? And that's not even the worst part. You die in one hit. So not only is the level design boring, not only are the hitboxes infuriating and sometimes even incorrect and glitchy, but now you have to inch along the game like everything's going to kill you. Surviving is literally up to luck if you do anything otherwise, because I'll go ahead and say it, this game is borderline broken. Heck, they didn't even get the money system right. Okay, so you know how despite when you die in Mario, you keep all the coins you collect? But when you die in this 8-bit land, you lose all the money you got since the previous checkpoint. Now I know you can cheat this to your advantage if you have like 90 something dollars and get extra lives every time you die, but when I die in a game, which by the way is going to happen here a lot, I kinda like to feel like I'm accomplishing something. But hey, I have to give credit where credit's due. Most of these enemies are straight from the show. There's collectible VHS tapes in each level, which unlocks some nice extras like concept art. And the power-up in the game is straight from the Death Kwon Do episode. Uh, Barog, we can't show that one due to copyright. No! Oh, and also Mario clogged the toilet. Again. No! But even then, WayForward just did not go far enough. These enemies are so generic and their attack patterns are so boring that you won't even care. They're just kinda there, I guess? I don't know, I feel like you're just better watching the show. But that, my friends, was only the first world. We still have three more to go, each with their own specific problems, so... <sighs> so, after you beat the Destroyer of Worlds at the end of World 1, you will knock a power-up that turns Mordecai... into a spaceship? <laughs> This is a bird! And a spaceship! What?! You know, despite this never, ever happening in the show, I guess this does look kinda cool. But the execution? It's terrible. Oh god, it's so terrible! You know what I think of when I think of a side-scrolling shoot 'em up I think of Gradius. I think of Life Force. You know, with the open space and waves of enemies trying to shoot you down? But in this game, the levels are designed the same size as the platforming levels. So guess what? They're cramped. And as a result, hitting these enemies feels like a chore, since the passageways are so narrow that these guys just take up all the space. And on top of that, this game expects you to switch between regular and spaceship Mordecai on the fly, which means if you don't turn back when you're directly on top of the spaceship area, you're dead. It's pretty bad design, but once again, thanks to the one-hit kill without a power-up, it's terrible. This is probably the first time I've ever seen anyone mess up the fundamentals of a space shooter, and they've been doing it right since 1978. So anyway, World 3. This time Ruby gets a transformation, and it's a top-down shooter where you get an Uzi? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about! Now this I can actually dig, since the Uzi is from the show, and enemies such as the Blonde Men and Summertime Song are here as well. But these segments are still poorly made. The problem isn't the controls or anything, those are actually decent here since the game actually gives you leeway on how you can shoot, it's the enemy AI. It's so bad. They always shoot in the same direction so it's not hard to kill them, until the game designer was like, shoot this is too easy, let's put them in really cheap spots. Yeah right behind that wall, yup that should be good! It gets ridiculous, and there's actually spots where the enemies will trap you without any way to attack them. At least the boss fight against the hammer is really cool. It's one of the few things I've really enjoyed in this game so far.
But the final world, World 4, it really hurt me to write about it. It's such a cool concept, it combines platforming, space shooting, and top-down shooting in one huge level, but it also combines everything I hate about the game in one package. Once again, the enemy placement is bad, the level design is bad, and you have to switch between the three forms more than ever here. And the final boss, Garrett Bobby Ferguson Jr., yes that's his real name, is broken beyond belief. He's actually a parody of Billy Mitchell, the former world record holder of Donkey Kong. Except you know he's a floating head and has legs coming out of his beard. Creepy. Anyway, I honestly don't think they tested this boss before the game shipped. The hitboxes are, once again, wrong on this dude's head, and believe it or not, his attack pattern actually wasn't coded properly, and as a result, my game crashed. Three times! This is one of the first times a 3DS game has ever crashed on me, and it's infuriating since this dude has several forms. He then calls upon his father, Garrett Bobby Ferguson, in the second half of the fight, you stomp and shoot him a few times and it's over. And the ending cutscene is soulless, unfunny, and abrupt. It definitely was not worth the trouble I went through to see it. At all. So despite all the bad things I said about it, is the game at least worth getting for regular show fans? Well, let's get straight to the review and find out. First up is fun, and well, I had almost no fun with this game. The side-scrolling levels are bland, boring, and the small passageways with Rigby is as fun as completing a kid's maze book. The shooter levels are cramped, bland, and the enemies are way too big in scale. The top-down segments are a little better with good control, but the enemy placement is cheap and the AI is horrible. And when they all come together, it's a lot weaker than the sum of its parts. The game does include a lot of nods of the show with enemy design, power-ups, and boss fights, but the execution is so poor that these gimmicks wear off within minutes. Almost all the main characters are missing, and there isn't enough content for even the most hardcore fans of the show. And that's another thing, whether you're a fan or not, this game gives no context on the show whatsoever. Sure, you may recognize a character or two, but there's no storyline explaining why they're even there. And on top of that, the enemies' names are never mentioned, not even in the manual, so anyone who's never watched regular show will give zero hex. So because of that, the only audience this game could cater to is retro game fans, but even then, you have here a derivative and awfully designed 2D platformer. And to add insult to injury, it's hard. It's really, really hard, and unlike other retro games, when you mess up, it's usually the game being cheap, not your amount of skill, something these retro games should be known for. So I hope you like crawling through the same level 10 to 20 times until you get lucky. So despite the game's attempts at fan service and innovative design, it's still getting an X from me. Second up is looks, and despite not being 8-bit, it seems alright at first. You got clean backgrounds, some well-animated sprites, lots of mazes... Ugh. However, the game slowly devolves into solid brown colors and similar backgrounds and... Wait, is that the same background as the title screen? Oh, wow! Wow! Throw in the fact that the 3D is actually layered incorrectly, which is an even bigger problem since the game changes perspective constantly, and you literally just have a brown mess. <laughs> Check minus. Third up is sound, which is by far the best part of the game. As I said before, Jake Coffin was in charge of this game's soundtrack, and it sounds amazing, and it was usually the only thing keeping me playing. Depending on what segment of the level you're on, the music will even change to sound more space-like or gritty for the top-down segments. And despite the lack of tracks, what we got here was really good. And they did the ooh thing, the thing that the thing they do. You know? Check. And fourth up is length. Now this is where I'm going to bash the game. Hard. For $30 you're getting a subpar platforming experience that you can 100% in under 3 hours. You heard me right, there are only 16 levels in the entire game and 4 boss fights at the same price as New Super Mario Bros. 2 which has over 80. This is one of the biggest ripoffs I've ever played. One of. <coughs> Yes, there are extra collectibles you can unlock, but hey, you know what? Let's talk about those for a second, shall we? Almost all the concept art you unlock in this game was never used. That's right, you have drawings of what would have made for great levels, but instead they slapped this game together. To me, it not only makes it absolutely clear that this game was rushed, but also serves as a huge smack to the face for the player, showing them what game they could have gotten if WayForward tried harder. So in total, for $30 you get 20 short levels, 48 VHSs to collect, a music player, this teasing concept art, and a new game plus with more enemies and a time limit, which really isn't worth playing through again and only adds about an hour or two to playtime. At full price, it is a scam. X. In conclusion, regular show Mordecai and Rigby in 8-Bit Land is a very poorly executed platformer. The basis for the ideas are all here, but in the end there's almost no content and what's there feels like a polished alpha version of a game. If a lot more of the way forward magic went into this concept, which they've done in several other 3DS games, we could have had a real winner here. But with the same number of levels as Mighty Switch Force, a game that they have on the eShop that is $6, no one should ever pay that much for this game. If you're a really hardcore regular show fan and you can find this game under, say, $10, then this game gets a check minus from me. Otherwise, it is definitely an X. 
So you remember that lesson I said I learned? Well, I think it's that, even though a game can remind us of our past and bring back the nostalgia we had playing these retro games, we have to learn to look past the facade and remember why we liked these games in the first place. It wasn't just about the visuals or the difficulty. It was about that pure and simple fun you had playing the game and playing it over and over again until you got really freaking good at it. And that is why I personally believe that retro games are still an awesome fad today. So, I guess there's only one way to deal with this game. It's a little lesson I learned from the show called The Death Dump, so if you'll excuse me. Oh god, Wario, what did you do here? Oh! No! Well, let's talk about my first impressions with the game. Oh!